something that is uh, the deepest, uh, the capacity that human beings have beyond the physical suffering, the, uh, the mental suffering. And um, the, uh, the seeds, the poisons that, that we cultivate are, are greed, anger, delusion. Those are the, every, every um, heavy mental state comes back to some version of those. And so tonight I wanted to look at that. I, I, you know, I went back through years of Dharma talks and I, I, don't, I don't know that I've ever given a Dharma talk on the three poisons. I, it's hard to believe because I talk about them all the time, but um, so this is just a review for the, you know, many of us are very familiar with this inquiry and others, it may be a, a new way of organizing your uh, understanding of what goes into the experience of being a human being that makes it so difficult. Um, so greed, anger, ignorance. These are the three unwholesome roots or the three fires, the three unwholesome roots. Um, and it's something we have it we can, when we begin to understand the nature of the roots of our own unhappiness, restlessness, aversion, we can begin to make different choices. So really what we're talking about is changing the view, changing the view that governs how we experience things. So what do we each know about greed? What, what are the forms that greed takes in your life? And I'm going to open that up just to a few, for a few people to say, what, how, does, how does greed manifest in your life? Just always wanting more Want, experience. Always wanting more. Creature comforts. More. More. Creature comforts more than I need. So there's a one more. Reduction, attention, uh -huh. wanting that. Always wanting more. Yeah, affection and attention. And um, creature comforts, affection, attention. Um, it's important before we go any further to say there is nothing wrong <laughs> with any of that because we, we thrive when we have what the body needs and what the heart needs. Um, so, uh, but, but the thing about greed, greed uh, has it inherent in that word is excessiveness, beyond need, greed is beyond need. Um, it's born of a sense of lack and that there's something missing uh, it's a belief that there is an imperative to a desire, right? Rather than just recognizing, oh, this is a desire. Nothing wrong with desire. But, but knowing the nature of it when it arises is very helpful in how to, uh, how to live with, live into it, how to respond how to see it as either a wholesome motivation or an unwholesome one. Wholesome being, it will lead to benefit for, for ourselves and for others. Unwholesome meaning it will bring harm and diminishment of well-being to ourselves or others. So um, born of lack, like something is missing. And the thing about it is that, um, you know, in the Dharma teaching, is that there is nothing missing. Every moment is complete in the way that it is. And a mind can formulate something that should be in it in this moment. <laughs> but the fact is, it's not. And so one of the things that we're part of the, uh, the view that we're cultivating is a, is a very realistic view. What is real in this moment? What is this life? What is the true version of this life in this moment? How is it presenting? The, um, the antidote to greed is 
to reflect on the changing nature of something. So let's say you want you want um, new clothes, you know, something material. Anything material is going to change. Anything conditioned is going to change. Relationships are going to change. You know, you are going to change. The body is going to change. Your car, your bike, it's all subject to dissolution. Um, so really coming to, to work with when greed comes up with the sensation of greed, of needing something, to recognize the question actually what, what is actually needed here. Um, so the second is uh, anger or um, what do we know about anger in ourselves? It's, it's not only um, anger, but it's um, aversion, repulsion, not being willing to, you know, what are the ways that it, it manifests in your life? And again, what, what other, what examples of this could you, could you uh, offer? Separation. Separation. What would be an example of that? Um, well, for me to be angry at someone, <clears throat> it has to be me here and that other person over there. Yeah, so it's, yeah. Based, it's based in a particular perception mm -hmm. that, that, that that over there, this over here, and um, which in one way is true. And then we can ask, in what way is that not so? Um, the thing about anger is it's, it's an emotion, right? And it's emotion, it's an emotion that uh, burns its own base. It's harmful. It's harmful when it's not, when we don't recognize the nature of it and what the, what the importance of it is. So I always think of anger as a bell ringing. Pay attention. Something is off here. And that's what's important about it. That's what the, uh, it is as a wholesome root, <laughs> is it, it um, propels us kind of urgently into being discerning and to reflect on what, what is being enacted here that is off base that's creating some kind of discomfort or harm. Uh, so, um, but when, when we, so it can be, and it is beneficial potentially, depending on our, our understanding of what it's all about. Holding it, some of the, uh, the images that are used to uh, describe this are, it's like holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Or like grasping a hot coal with the intention of throwing it, but you grasp it first, right? And that it, it, we've most likely, I kind of hope everybody has experienced anger. <laughs> Otherwise we need to poke a little bit more. Um, but um, but it, if it's acted out without it being and a way of discerning, then it's harmful. As we all know, it can be very harmful when we act it out. But at times, it can be extremely important to pay attention to it and to um, to discern what what is it, you know, like in the misuse of power, where if somebody crosses boundaries in a way that is not invited, there are times to be able to get the energy from anger and use it skillfully. So we're always, we always, no matter what we're, to, we're looking at in uh, Dharma teachings, we're always talking about the importance of knowing the nature of what we're experiencing. We're not, there's nothing to be excluded from our life. We don't squelch anything. We pay attention to it and learn what it is, what it's about. And that releases us to be, uh, to experience our life much more vividly, actually. 
because we don't have to fend off or close down against any quality, any energy quality that comes along in our emotions. So greed, anger, aversion, separation, and then ignorance. And we could say that everything that creates um, disturbance or unhappiness or suffering is caused by ignorance. So one of the, uh, the primary uh, practices with this is whenever you're really having a hard time, know that you are caught in a state of ignorance about the true nature of what's going on. That's really helpful. I find it very helpful. Whenever I'm in a suffering state, I need to recall. So what is it that I need to recall? All conditioned things are impermanent. That's, that's one of the primary teachings of the Buddha. All conditioned things are impermanent. So um, there are two, two parts of that statement, conditioned, all conditioned things. And everything is conditioned. Everything is a, is a result of conditions coming together and being mani and manifesting, whether it be material, you know, any, look at the number of objects of material objects in this room. They are all conditioned. They've all come about through, you know, the cloth, the fiber, the flesh, the lighting, everything is a combination of every other thing of so many other um, uh, materials and <clears throat> ingredients. All conditioned things are impermanent. Everything that comes together falls apart. And then um, another part of ignorance is the sense that this self is real in an absolute way. Absolute meaning unchanging. Absolute meaning separate from everything else. That's, that's a mistaken notion when we look more closely at the self. There are, I forget how many trillion cells involved and organisms involved in your body at the moment, co-living. It's a, it's a big community in each of us. We have, we have so much that has gone into uh, coming to this moment in our flesh body, which began all the way back with the first cell on this planet and the, begin, the continual replication and, and um, multiplication of cells. Uh, everything we learn, we have received, whether we are aware of it or not. So that's, that's one of the things that we uh, get so aware of in, when we study karma, that we have inhabited, we've all been born into a family with all kinds of attitudes and habits. And that family comes out of many, many situations. You know, all the many people who, who make that family and the historical conditions that have, have uh, evolved, the ways of believing the world is the ways of relating to the physical body, relating to our, to our loved ones, relating to money, relating to sex. There's just so much that is transmitted way beyond our own individual, that goes into our own individual manifestation. So this self is subject to many, many influences that are seen and unseen at all times. We look into that in our practice. Um, and when we're in Zazen, that's a time that's kind of a pure set of conditions for looking into what is making up this moment of experience. If we're really caught up in thinking, one thing we could say is, well, thinking is what's going on. Mm -hmm but then your knee starts to hurt and suddenly it's more than just thinking, it's, it's a physical discomfort. I mean, we, there's so much to be seen when we are doing zazen. That's, that, that's the skillful means of zazen, 
It's also the complete expression of it, an awakened being to be thoroughly present. To notice consciousness, to notice the display in the mind. So ignorance is all condition, uh, uh, being aware of impermanence, of no self. And we explore that a lot as we practice. Uh, ignorance is also not noticing cause and effect, not being aware of the consequences of our own actions. We can see this all around us in the world. The Dharma is con con constantly on display, not noticing cause and effect is, I mean, how can we possibly have war <laughs> if we fully noticed cause and effect in our own minds and then amplified out into the collective communities? Uh, ignorance is thinking that our ultimate happiness is found outside of ourselves, out, found in conditioned things, in certain beliefs, in certain physical conditions. Uh, ignorance is also a sense of being unworthy, being unworthy of respect and love based on a belief that we are not complete. There is something wrong with us. That's a real grasping after a self and believing a voice, a critical, an inner critic voice as the way things actually are. So that's delusion. I mean, we call it ignorance, but it's also, all of this is delusion. And then going back to some of the earliest teachings is um, getting caught up in, in the senses and taking the sense world as the whole of reality the senses, the five physical senses, and then the, the sixth, with, which is the mind. So thinking that our thoughts are real. I mean, one of the, one of the most incredible practices when doing Zazen is to, as thoughts arise, and they do, I mean, some thoughts are unbidden, but, uh, or, and held on to, but a lot are unbidden. You know, a lot just kind of pop up how do I know I'm thinking? What is that thought anyway? What makes it up? Do I hear it? Is it a picture in the mind, right? So that's, that way we, it, it's a penetrating inquiry to go beyond the senses. It's not just the senses. Thinking um, and taking the thinking mind as something greater, there really is, there's the, the cognitive mind, the mind of thought, and then there's the awareness. Awareness is not uh, confined to anything. <laughs> it's not necessarily individual. It can be collective. When we sit in a room like this in silence and stillness, there's an awareness that is uh, generated by the entire community of mind. There's a, uh, I, I was in a, uh, at, a, at the end of a retreat once, my teacher chosen asked, she said, I have a list here of 20 things and I want everybody to raise your hand if you experience these during Sashin, during retreat. And she went through and she named a whole bunch of things, thoughts, sensations, um, emotions, hot dogs. <laughs> and <laughs> practically everybody raised their hands at the same time and didn't raise their hands at the same time. And that was just such an incredible you know, uh, example of how uh, awareness is, shared in many ways, but it's outside of, it's not concrete enough to notice it. Um, another thing that I, I see, and you may know that, notice this for yourself, that some days when um, 
you see a friend or something and they say, well, how are you doing? And you say, oh, God, I just had so much trouble sleeping last night. I woke up at three o'clock. And they said, I woke up at three o'clock. I never wake up at three o'clock. And, you know, I'm a, a therapist and sometimes I'll see a number of people and everybody, including myself, woke up at 2.30 in the morning, right? What is that? So that's one of the joys of practice is we really begin to behold the mind, the way the mind works, and it's so much more than we realize. Um, okay, so the last thing I have here is also being aware, unaware, ignorance is being unaware of how much we project our thoughts onto complex conditions and the projection see, selects a certain set according to everything we are our attitudes our beliefs our fears our joys you know whatever we, we are always uh, collecting a set from the infinity infinite um, <laughs> conditions of any moment and this really informs us when we when we think about how am I going to deal with the the world situation right now. Well, it's very helpful to recognize how we can get very very caught in a particular narrative, which may not be wrong, but it's only a very small bit of everything that is unfolding. Um, so uh, Mara, so many of you know the story of the Buddha's enlightenment. And when he's sitting there, uh, the night that supposedly one night <laughs> that he awoke, um, he is visited by Mara in the form of, um, you know, marauding armies coming straight at him, these images, these terrifying images or obnoxious smells or incredibly seductive um, uh, women and energies around him. And, um, and he, he just keeps the seat of Zazen. He is not drawn in. He's so aware of the projections of his own mind. And uh, he says, Mara, who is the, the personification of delusion, Mara, now I know you. Now I know you. He, he recognized his own mind at work. And that was at the same moment that he, he really understood the nature of everything. The uh, interconnectedness, the impermanence, the, uh, the tendency to mistake aversion for what is real aversion for what is permanent, right? Um, Mara, now I know you. So that's where we get to in our own practice when we begin to gain confidence in our practice. Uh, we, we terrifically do need Sangha. We need teachings. We need a teacher. But each of us does our own practice. And, and at a certain point, we realize, we wake up, we open our Dharma eye for ourselves, And then we can say, when we come into any mind state, any difficulty, now I know you, Mara. I know what this mind is doing here. Um, and um, we can say, I see how interdependent and impermanent and empty of self nature, all aspects of my life are. In what way that's true. This doesn't deny, uh, you know, there are two truths, the relative truth, we're all living a relative life in samsara in the world of desire and illusion and delusion. But we also all are, are um, living in nirvana, which is a word, it's a word, it's not a place, it's not a thing. It's a way of signifying a view that, that encompasses the entirety 
of how, uh, how our experience is configured through the senses, through uh, material, the material world, and also through the immaterial and the energetic and the etheric. The energies, some energies are extremely subtle. You find as you, as you proceed in um, practice, you become much more sensitive, much more sensitive to everything that is in here's in a moment, everything that's making up your experience. I realize the nature of Mara and I realize the nature of Buddha because we both, we're, we're subject, we express, we manifest both all the time. Buddha nature. And I realize the mind of Mara and I realize the mind of Buddha. Can you say that? I think that none of us would be here if we didn't. We may not have realized it, but there's some, there's some very, very um, compelling wisdom bringing us to practice. And sometimes, you know, I might ask each of you, why are you here? And some would be able to say, blah, 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 that's why I'm here. And other people would say, I don't know. I just, I just, I need to come. I wanted to come. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, when we look at our, uh, our spiritual unfolding, it's very mysterious how it all comes about. Um, so, uh, let's see, this is Ink and Roshi. Through all the thunder, lightning, pounding rain, sweet bird song, and delicate early morning light, cool discerning mind and hot passion, cold anger and toughness and stupidity and ignorance, forgetting and mindfulness, all of it. You know, that's a, that's a lovely description of uh, the mind that it includes everything, nothing is excluded. We could say that's the definition of spiritual. Spiritual is where everything is included, nothing is excluded. So Thich Nhat Hanh gives Siddhartha these words at his awakening. Thich Nhat Hanh was the great uh, Vietnamese Zen master, poet, activist. Clouded by endless waves of deluded thoughts, the mind has falsely divided reality into subject and object, self and other, existence and non-existence. And from these discriminations arose wrong views, the prisons of feeling, cravings, grasping, and becoming. Oh, Mara, now I see you. How many lifetimes have you confined me in the prisons of birth and death? Now I see your face clearly. So that's what we can all aspire to and practice with, be inspired by. The thing about Buddhism, which is unusual, is it's not actually, it is a religion in ways, but it's not actually a religion in that we don't, uh, we look to the kind of historic, semi quasi mythical historic figure of Buddha as a human being who was dissatisfied, restless, puzzled, and um, an inquisitive. And then he, he said, okay, here's what I've discovered. And it's inherent in a human life. And you can discover it too. And this is how, right? So that's, that's the, that's the path. Um, let's see. Oh yeah. 
So in this story about Mara visiting the Buddha at, at the night of his enlightenment, uh, in one version it says he sent, uh, Mara sent three da his three daughters to tempt the Buddha to give up his quest. And you know, when you're sitting in Zazen, there are a lot of things that can tempt you to stop. One is you remember something urgent to do, like you have to do the laundry, you know, <laughs> or, uh, or you get pain in your knee and you just can't stand it anymore. And so you have to get up. I mean, there are all kinds of things that, or, or the thought that, oh, this is ridiculous. What am I doing? I don't know what I'm doing. This is, this is hogwash. Um, so the three daughters are Tanha, craving, Arati, boredom, and Raga, passion. On, in other accounts, uh, they refer to the existence of five daughters who, who, are, who represent the three poisons, attraction, aversion, and delusion. And added to that are pride and fear. These are all the things that, that uh, seem very real and distract us from really inquiring more deeply into our experience in the moment. Pride. Um, how does that experience, how does that, um, how does that get in your way in practice? Pride. Anybody have that experience in any way? inwardly focused, you know, you're, you're proud of something inside yourself, uh, and that's a delusion. Self-cherishing, maybe, mm -hmm. that there's something, yes, and one form would, might be, um, I, had a, I had an experience of great peace, so that's it, I know, right? Yeah? Keeps us from beginners not, not knowing. Keeps us from not knowing, lovely, yeah, exactly. Beginner's mind is open, receptive, interested, hasn't made a decision, doesn't have a version, doesn't have a version. <laughs> um, not knowing, that's a very profound practice, not knowing. How do you do it when you're in a, in a political argument with somebody not knowing? That's a really, really demanding practice. It's also a great time to recognize what the sensation of knowing, of I know, is. I, is very distinct from you, and I know, and you don't, right? So there's a, or there's a, I know, I know, and then there's agreement, and that feels really good. And it plumps up the opinion and it deepens the fixity of, belief, of, of view and belief. <clears throat> so, um, so all of these uh, daughters, um, so-called daughters, the ways that that's described, um, are all about, are all based in a sense of separation. Separation. The Abhidharma lists the qualities of delusive experience as 51 types of thoughts. And I don't have that with me right now, but there are many, they, they list so many different characteristics of mind in thought. It's, it's a fascinating, and I should do that. I should make a chart, post it, because you sit there and you think, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's all there, and when it's pointed out, you notice it, you know, and before it's pointed out, it's just the world the way it is. And also um, uh, names three impulses that grow out of hot passion, cold anger and toughness, and, and stupidity. So how, do, how are those characteristics how do you experience those in your life? You know, hot passion. Well, that's it. there's enthusiasm. There's a sense of um, great determination. 
which is always, of course, we say uh, that kind of hot passion applied to Dharma practice is wholesome. <laughs> but applied to, I don't know what, something else isn't. What would, where would it not be wholesome? Hot passion. Social media. <laughs> what? Social media. <laughs> Social media. Competition. Competition. Yeah. Certain relationships that are out of born out of desperation or are um, uh, destructive in some way. Um, so stupidity defined in this way is believing that which is impermanent is actually permanent. Any, any one of these marks or markers that are pointed out in Dharma can be the entirety of your practice. It's so, it's so wonderful. This is such a rich description of the way it is to be a human being. And we can really take any, anything as guidance and a way to practice with it. Stupidity is believing that which is without self is self or that which is has no birth and death <clears throat> is born and dies another way to say that is everything changes is there anything that does not change that's a that too is a wonderful wonderful contemplation as we go through our days so now the dharma is good medicine it's good medicine for our experience of suffering. And in the very distant past, the Medicine Buddha Sutra tells us that Manjushri comes to the Buddha in Vaisali and asks for a teaching, for a dose of Dharma medicine, and is given a teaching on the three pills. So I wanted just to go through those a little bit. Turning the mind to stillness that is not disturbed by motion. Turning the mind to stillness that is not disturbed by motion. And that's, that's a, a, one, one way that we can always, that's a pill we can always take no matter where we are actually. because it, it inspires us to look into what is the still point that is rumored to be discernible by any of us, right? What is it? And the next, the other pill is silence that is not disturbed by sound. What is the silence that is not disturbed by sound? And then the third pill is pristine awareness. These pills are really subtle, which means that if you're going to take the pill, you have to really relax and become very, very concentrated in your attention. Silence that is not disturbed by sound. I would, um, if you listen to music, um, jazz, classical, some singers, not all music is like that, but there's, there's certain music at the very heart of it is profound silence that this is pointing at. And in order to work with these pills, to take these pills, you, you, it's important to be able to establish a very stable concentration, 
which is why we really urge people to do retreat. We, we can't develop that kind of stability. There's so much resistance to it. <laughs> that um, retreat is very, very helpful in uh, establishing that kind of stability of attention, of concentration. It's not found online. It's not found in the cyber mind or in a big box store shopping where there's any distraction. Distraction meaning attraction. <laughs> attraction that takes us away from this inner silence and stillness, still point. And when we, when we learn how to practice in this way, uh, we have found refuge. We really found profound refuge that we can trust. It's not the same as changing the world, the world of samsara, because the nature of samsara is suffering, delusion, desire, aversion but it is refuge which is brings a kind of balance into uh, our presence in the world which brings great benefit not only personally but to anybody whose lives we touch that kind of stability um, So I wanted to just read a couple of things before I finish. One is, uh, this is by Rio Khan, Rio Khan, and uh, expressing this silence that is not disturbed by sound. A quiet night behind my grass hut. Alone, I play a stringless lute its melody drifts into the wind-blown clouds and fades. Its sound deepens with the running stream, expanding till it fills a deep ravine and echoes through the vast woods. Who, other than a deaf person, can hear this faint song? Oh yeah, so I have two more, two more things here. This is um, a quote about delusion and ignorance from Thomas Cleary, who was a great translator. There's never been such a thing as Buddha. So do not understand it as Buddha. Buddha is a medicine for emotional people. If you have no disease, you should not take medicine. When medicine and disease are both dissolved, it's like pure water. Buddhahood is like a sweet herb mixed in the water or like honey mixed in the water, most sweet and delicious. And yet the pure water itself is not affected. And then I'll finish with this blessing. Just as the soft rain fills the streams, pours into the rivers and joins the ocean. May the power of every moment of your being flow forth in a healing current of awakening. For those here now, those gone before, and those yet to come. By your power in every moment, may you transform any obstacle into wisdom and compassion. May all dangers be averted and all disease gone. 
manifesting the great mystery within you, through you, and emanating everywhere. May your heart's wishes and your visions be fulfilled, shining as the bright full moon. Visible or hidden, know your moon never leaves the sky. For you whose heart dwells in respect, who follows the way, I give you these blessings. May your life prosper with beauty, endurance, faith, and great age. May you always be really intimate with yourself. Okay, five. <laughs>